Well, good evening. Um, my name is well, Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling. Um, I'm the. Uh, my name. How are we doing? <laughs> How are we doing? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> and it uh, it is a hard act to follow, and people yeah, wonder why we are a little afraid of going online for taking applications. Um, at any rate, I uh, wanted to welcome everyone here this evening. My name is Brian Wakeling. I'm the uh, chief of the game management here with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Um, Wanted to, uh, to introduce uh, Ron Day, who will be uh, presenting the seminar here this evening. He's a biologist within the game branch, um, very accomplished in uh, many aspects of, uh, of hunting, and a uh, very good biologist. Um, just a couple of things, um, as, as you know, a lot of just real curious here. Um, how many of you are, uh, are first time hunters? Outstanding. Hunters. Great. We're glad to have you here this evening. Outstanding. Um, Great. We're glad to have you here this evening. Um, Great. We're glad to have you here this evening. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, we're webcasting this, so not only can we embarrass ourselves in front of you, but anybody that happens to choose to come in. And we also plan to have this available on the website uh, so that... This is... But we'll have it on the website so people can view this at a later we'll date if they are unable to see it to here this evening or be here this evening. We're real glad to see everybody here. Um, you know, hunting is a very important part uh, of people's heritage, and it's what's really important to them. Um, it really connects people with nature and in ways that just wildlife viewing doesn't necessarily do so. Um, it's kind of the, the crux of what we call the North American model of wildlife conservation. Um, hunters and anglers uh, were some of the first people that recognized how uh, dire things were looking for wildlife back at the turn of the century and how important it was to really try and restore our wildlife populations. Um, since that time, there's been a number of, of approaches to funding wildlife. Um, the most successful has been the Pittman-Robertson Act, uh, followed by the Dingle-Johnson, and it's been providing an awful lot of funding for the work that, it, that wildlife agencies across the nation do. Arizona's fortunate that we've also got a couple of under, other funding sources, um, the Wildlife Conservation Fund and the Heritage Fund, and we'd just like to kind of remind everybody how important those fund sources are as well. Um, a lot of people think of those as being simply things that, that do things for non-game wildlife, but they also do an awful lot for game. Um, they provide, uh, and just like the Pittman-Robertson Act has done an awful lot for non-game work. Um, it's really critical. Um, and Without that funding, the Arizona Game and Fish Department would be far less successful. And, of course, we are also incredibly reliant upon volunteers, uh, people that uh, are able to participate and uh, um, uh, actually help us get a lot of work done that we wouldn't be able to get done without that volunteer help. They're still, volunteers are still, the, uh, the, the hunters and anglers and, and wildlife viewers, still the crux of what makes wildlife conservation possible. Um, if you're not registered to vote, you know, that's what really makes a difference. You guys have to, you know, decisions are made by those that show up, and so it's really critical that you do. As I mentioned, we're webcasting this tonight, so um, we're hoping that the microphones continue to work because without the microphones, the folks in the uh, web are unable to hear this. Um, also, if you have any questions this evening, uh, we do have a microphone up here, um, and would ask that you'd use that microphone to, uh, um, um, so you can hear yourself talk as well. Um, so but you use that microphone well. so the people um, in the, uh, that, that are hearing this as a webcast are able to hear it, uh, hear your questions, and, um, hear your questions, if it's a very simple question, perhaps Ron would be able to, uh, respond to that, uh, or just repeat your question for you. Um, there, they've also got the people that are in the, uh, being, listening to this from a webcast, you've got the ability to send us an email. Um, if you're looking at it, it's got a, email address on there. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and email a question in, and we'll respond to those. Um, with no further...
Uh, listen to yourself talk. Uh, listen to yourself talk. Uh, listen to yourself talk. Well, good evening. Well, good evening. This evening, we are going to have a presentation on. We are going to have a presentation on deer hunting. This is specifically targeting new hunters, young hunters. That anybody, uh, it's going to be of interest to anybody who is planning on going deer hunting in the near future. Who is planning on going deer hunting in the near future? Some of the things that we are going to cover this evening is being prepared. A lot of your experience in the field is going to depend on how much time you've spent before you ever leave home getting ready to go. Before you ever leave home, getting ready to go. We're going to cover locating and seeing deer. We're going to cover locating and seeing deer. When and where to find deer. When and where to find deer. Uh, once you've found deer and decided to take a shot, we're going to cover once shot placement deer, as well as field care once you've taken a deer. Field care once you've taken a deer. For those people who are on the Kayabab, we're also For going to cover checking it out, and that is what you need to do to check your deer out when you're on the Kayabab, as well as condors and uh, the impacts of lead and what we do to uh, alleviate or reduce the impacts of lead as they apply to condors. Currently this year, we have 20 junior deer hunts that you'll see in our hunt regulations. Um, if you're not familiar with what those are, these are a specific set of hunts that are designed to allow younger hunters, and by our definition of junior hunters, um, junior hunters to participate in a deer hunt to where it's usually them, their parents, um, or an aunt or an uncle, but they're out there just with other junior deer hunters. It's a little bit... Uh, um, maybe less competitive than what it would be if you were in a, a very crowded hunting environment. But we have, this year, 20 of these hunts. Totaling a total of 2,170 deer tags, and they're scattered around the state. Um, getting to preparing for the hunt, and probably uh, one of the things that everybody thinks about, particularly young hunters, is shooting. And this slide right here is just kicking off the fact that, by and large, you're not born as a natural shooter. These are skills that are developed no different than any other skill that you develop as you uh, through experience. The thing to develop these skills, without a doubt, is practice, practice, and more practice. Now, looking at this uh, girl down here in the lower left photo, just from looking at that photo, what would you guess? And I, this is a question to the audience. What would you think looking at that photo offhand? Well, if you looking right at the way she's covering her eye, this is a shooter with a dominant left eye with the rifle on her right shoulder. And that's very, very common. Um, people that are naturally right-handed in everything you do, if you shoot left-handed, it's because that's where your mind wants you to shoulder the rifle because you have a dominant left eye. Um, I'm going um, to bounce back to this previous slide. And let's just talk about shooting a little bit. You really can't understate practicing and developing the skills necessary to shoot well. And when doing this, particularly um, younger kids, can't stress enough doing it with something that is comfortable to shoot. All the photos you see right here, these are young people shooting 22s. 22s have zero recoil. You don't have to think about whether or not that gun's going to kick, if it's going to have a lot of recoil, is it going to bounce back, and is it going to punch them? They can really focus on sight picture, where the crosshairs are, and trigger squeeze, where those crosshairs are when the sear breaks and that gun goes off. And these are things that you have to do in a controlled environment. Realize when you're out hunting, when you're out in the field hunting, truly the only thing you have control over is 
where your gun shoots and how well you shoot it. Everything else is a variable. Um, you don't know if you're going to see a deer that day. You're not. You don't know if the deer you're going to see is a buck or a doe or whatever your tag says. But truly, the only thing that you have complete control over is where your rifle shoots and how well you can shoot it. And those are actually two different things. You know, where your rifle shoot is shoots is what we do out here on the range. And we stress shooting at a range versus, you'll hear a term maybe, uh, uh, it's called wildcat shooting, people shooting in areas where they can legally shoot, but they're not in controlled situations. Uh, but we stress shooting at a range. This is where you're going to have the best conditions that you're going to have to shoot that rifle. It's, you have a rock solid rest, everything is controlled, you're shooting at a good target and a known yardage. And this is where you truly sight in your rifle and see how well it shoots and sight it in to where it's shooting as well as it can. The situations you see here with these kids, they're out in the field and they're, they're, these are hunting situations. They might be rabbit hunting, they might be out in the field doing something other than the controlled situation that you have at the range. Their rifle is already shooting well. Here they're practicing shooting it from the various positions that are required when you're hunting. So the, this is pre-hunt um, practice. This is where skills that people develop, shooting skills that people develop, this is where you learn them and this is where you practice them. This is where you learn them and this is where you practice them. Taking the shot. Now, it might seem like you jumped all the way up, but we're talking about shooting here. And these are things that really I can't stress enough. These are a few things that they might seem really simple, but they're going to determine whether or not you've made a good shot or a bad shot, whether or not you've placed the bullet where you wanted to or missed it entirely. The first thing that in a hunting situation that most people do is they rush. They've been hunting for X number of hours, X number of days. They see something, oh my gosh, there it is. They're excited. Adrenaline's going. Their heart is pumping. They're breathing fast. They hurry up. It's going to get away, and they rush. And that oftentimes results in something less than what they would like. So in almost all circumstances, an individual has more time than what they truly think they have. So the flip side of that is the first thing, take your time. Take your time. By doing that, control your breathing. Probably out while you're hunting. There's two things that influence where your influence your placement shot more than anything else, and that is your breathing. You're excited, and triggers trigger control. The third one. You hear somebody called um, uh, jerking the trigger, and that is they're not. They're truly not paying attention to squeezing it. <laughs> Um, what I have found when I've been hunting with my kids, and it's something I truly recommend if you have time, if you're in a situation that allows you is dry fire, fourth thing on this list. When it comes time to take that shot, if you're, for example, shooting at a, dirt, a deer or a javelina, something that doesn't know you are there and you have plenty of time, you are from a distance that's not going to influence whatever it is that you're going to shoot at, and that is with no round in the chamber, sit there, build a rest, get a good rest, and then with my kids I'd say, okay, I want you to take a shot. And every time I've ever done this, it has gone like this. It has gone like you can watch and they've jerked the trigger. There's not a round in the chamber, so this is just a practice time. We're far enough away that deer might be two, three hundred yards to where we haven't spooked the deer, but I've, as dad said, you missed. Let's try that again. And all I do is raise the bolt, cock the rifle, and then tell them, focus on where your sight picture is and squeezing the trigger. And you really can't stress the squeezing the trigger enough. And then when they sit there and click and you don't see that rifle move in any way, shape, or form when the sear falls, then you say, okay, that was a good shot. Now we're going to do it. And then you put a round in the chamber, and they've never missed when they've done that. So that is really calm. If you think of everything we've talked about, what you're doing there is you're getting control of the situation. 
You're calming everything back down. They're being able to control their breathing. They're being able to sit there and slowly regain their composure. Because the very first shot when we've sat there and dry fired it, boom, that was an air ball. You know, we missed that one. But by having one that actually was good, now they're in control of all the things that they did out there on the range when they were shooting well. They're finally tuned back into those. Chamber round, and that round is usually good. Um, at least with my kids, it was good. The last thing that I ask them, and my kids know I'm going to ask them this, and that's the last thing on the slide. Where were your crosshairs when you shot? And if this doesn't matter if it's kids, if it's adults, whoever, if they cannot tell me where their crosshairs were, most of the time it wasn't a good shot. Most of the time it was a miss. If you, when you're shooting, if you're cognizant of exactly where your crosshairs are, first thing are, if you did miss, you know it because you know where your crosshairs were when you shot. Um, but most of the time, it kind of, once again, pulls you back into the realm of control to where, think of where your crosshairs were when you shot. Okay, we're still in the process of getting ready before we go hunting. And uh, there seems to be a growing trend as I get older to forget more and more. Um, I haven't forgot everything, but there's very rarely a trip that I don't forget something anymore. So what I recommend is you start a list. Um, the earlier you start the list, the less the chance of you actually forgetting something. For those of you who are planning on going hunting with your kids, this is a great activity for your kids to sit there and build that list. You're working with them. You're getting everything together, and you're going through and getting all the things on a list. Um, sounds pretty simple, but it'll sure make life a lot easier when you get all the way out to where you're finally at and realize you don't have your bullets. So... Lists help you prevent all these things that uh, are real simple to solve when you're in downtown Phoenix. They're not so easy to solve when you're out in the middle of nowhere. So that is the importance of a list. GPS. Now, we all know what GPS is. We have it in our phones. We have it in our cars. We probably have it in a little GPS unit in our backpack. But for those of you who uh, are going hunting with your kids, one thing that will give you great peace of mind, something that I always did with my kids is, is at a very young age, I gave it to them, and I made them use the GPS unit. Not me. I know how to use the GPS unit. I want them to know how to use the GPS unit. And several times during the course of the hunt, I'd give them the GPS unit, and I'd say, okay, turn that on, and you are going to take us back to the car. You're taking us back to the camp. You're, you're at least going to show me you know what direction the camp is. And, you know, when you're talking about with your kids, one of the things that I always did with my kids, regardless of their age, is uh, I told them where my truck keys were. I told them uh, how to start the car, how to turn the heater on. These are all things that you do for your kids. Um, when we're talking juniors hunters, it's just kind of a peace of mind, uh, as well as uh, equipping them for being able to survive unforeseen circumstances. So being prepared means just not you, because you, as we as adults, know how to take care of ourselves. But we have to make sure that our kids know how to take care of ourselves, themselves also. These are just some of the details of the GPS systems that we all know. Probably the neatest thing on a regular basis is the compass. Um, a lot of people have an internal compass that it doesn't matter what, how far they've been going. If it's trees, if it's dark, they tend to know what direction it takes to get back to the car, what direction north is, what direction it is to the nearest highway. But there's a whole lot of people who don't have that ability. And that's one of the neat things that a GPS unit does is uh, you can test yourself and it allows you the ability to figure out what part of the world you're in. Keep in mind that, an that a GPS unit is an electronic device. And the very, very first time I thought, and this was back in about 1998, I had one of these neat things. And I always carried it, and I never really had any issues with it. And I thought, well, let's just see. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to mark where my truck is. And I was doing it at work, and I walked around for a couple hours, and I thought, okay, let's see if this thing takes me home. And my little GPS unit, it fires up, and it said, all internal data has been lost. <laughs> that was the very first time that I tried to use my GPS unit for something other than a paperweight. And it really kind of drove home the fact that this is its a poor replacement for just a compass.
you know, a compass is always going to point north. It's an instrument that's not going to fail when the batteries run out. GPS units are modern technology at their finest, but don't forget, they are modern technology. So it's hard to beat a good compass. So it's hard to beat a good compass. Okay, we're still preparing a good map. Um, it gives you a lot of information. I always have a map with me regardless of how many times I've been there and how well I know the area. I'm just kind of one of those people who like maps. Uh, but if you don't know in an area well or if you're going to into an area for the very first time, a map is invaluable. You're not going to be able to get to where you want to go nearly as fast as you'd like to be there without a map. Maps are cool. Whether it's a Forest Service map or a topo map, kind of depends on how far you have to go. I really, you know, the BLM maps and the top, and uh, Forest Service maps for we have a couple of units that uh, are based on that format that are game management unit maps. But all these maps that provide a large scale, something that is big enough to allow you to get to where you need to be going. And once you're there, then you can unroll a topo map for the fine detail. So there's almost two types of maps that you need. If you're going to the Kayabab and you want to know how do I get from Jacob Lake all the way down to the south side, the south end down on the west side, you're not going to want to use a topo map for that because you're going to go through about eight of them to get down there. But you're only going to be on one side of your Forest Service map to go all the way down there. Scale is everything. So the large scale, lots of country, you know, one mile equals about uh, half to, uh, you know, three quarters of an inch. That's a good scale when you're traveling across the country. Once you get there and you want to get into more detail, see where the springs are, see where some of the trails are, uh, then a topo map with a larger seven and a half minute scales of a lot more value. There's a lot of information to be found on our website. There's a lot of information to be found on our website. Just depending on if you're in an area that you don't know very well and you are curious as to what different types of animals are there, there are uh, species lists for most of our areas. These are compiled by our wildlife managers in the area, the person whose responsibility it is to manage the wildlife. Um, there's also, as you can see on this slide, uh, outdoor events, new items, guides and taxidermists. Uh, there's also, uh, particularly in the back of our Hunt regs, uh, meat processors, you know, all of these things, if you're a hunter and if you uh, have uh, varying degrees of ability and or time, depending on what you want to do with whatever it is that you're out pursuing, you know, a meat cutter, a good meat cutter is invaluable being able to uh, get what you would like out of your hunt. Pack and hunt supplies. This is the something to pack around the equipment that you take. Something to pack around the equipment that you take. You know, I typically I have both of these packs with me when I'm deer hunting, but they they serve two totally different purposes. The day pack right there is something that I hunt with. And in my day pack, I have most of the things that we're going to point at right here when I go through the slide. Um, they're things that I'm going to be hunting with as well as things that I'm going to be using to process any game that I take while I'm hunting. But I don't pack, I don't carry around that big pack frame, um, mainly because of noise, but I know a lot of people that do. A lot of people will take that pack frame and put their day pack on top of that pack frame and carry the whole thing all at one time. But uh, that, the main use of that big pack frame is finally at the end of the hunt when you're trying to figure out how you're going to get your deer from point A to point B. Point A is where it fell over, and point B is your car or your truck or your camp, and you're trying to get it there. And there's very few times when you're hunting something big like a deer or an elk, an antelope, that you're going to be able to get it back to camp or back to your source of uh, um, your vehicle in one piece, which means it's going to have to come out in something less than one piece, which is when the knife and the saw and the pack frame all comes into play. Um, packing that stuff out. This is equipment that if you have with you, it's going to make your work once you're successful in your hunt a whole lot easier. I kind of thought it was interesting looking at these, and I didn't have, I didn't build this slide, but looking at it, the two things that came into the slide last were the, were the deer tag was second to the last, and the binoculars was the very last thing. If this was me, 
my binoculars would be first followed very, very shortly by my deer tag. No, I, I like my binoculars a whole lot, and we'll get into that. I like my binoculars a whole lot, and we'll get into that. Survival equipment. Those people that have been lost, and everybody that's hunted has been lost to one degree or another, and it kind of depends on what your definition of loss is. Um, if your definition of loss is not knowing where the truck is on a 10-minute basis, then you've been lost. Some people don't really think they're lost for about two days. I think they're just stubborn and don't want to refuse or admit that they don't know where they are. But people who admit that they're lost say that the number one comforting thing about being lost, particularly if you're out in the woods by yourself overnight, is to be able to build a fire. You probably uh, have heard that before, but if in, in my survival gear, um, the thing that I use, the, that I make sure that I have, is some way to start a fire. And that to me isn't one way. That is always two ways. I guarantee you that the first time you need to start a fire, your waterproof matches will not light. That's just kind of Murphy's Law. Your waterproof matches, you haven't looked inside that little neat case that it comes in. You haven't looked inside that in about a year or maybe two. And when you open it up, all those really neat looking wooden matches with that wax covered red tip are now just wooden matches and inside the bottom of that is just a bunch of red powder. So they don't have, they're not matches anymore. But there are some really neat, innovative ways to start a fire that do not require a match. One of the things that I always have and I taught my kids how to use, and, and I keep them in a film canister, and, re, and keep in mind there are a whole variety of ways to make a fire other than using a match. And the, the take-home message to this slide is make sure you have a minimum of two ways to start a fire with you. They don't take up any space. It takes up far less space than this little remote does. Is, uh, is I have a little film, a black 35 millimeter film canister case, and in it is just some cotton balls, real cotton, that are soaked in Vaseline. That's all they are, soaked in Vaseline. And I take a cotton ball, I put a bunch of Vaseline on it, and I go like this, put it into my hand, and I shove it in there. And then the other thing I have that everybody has probably seen is one of these little magnesium blocks with a striker on it. And to make a fire, all you do is you take that cotton ball. I started a fire with one of my cotton balls in April, and I promise you, I haven't. That's been in that stuff for 10 years inside my pack. And I took one of them out. You just... Pull it apart a little bit to where you don't have a big wad of cotton and, and Vaseline. You pull it apart, and it's going to be kind of a sticky mess. Pull it apart, take that magnesium striker and scrape some magnesium on it, throw a spark in there, and poof, it'll light right away. It's amazing that that lights all the time. Um, but whatever you use, two sources of starting a fire. Remember, at this point, when you're dipping into your survival kit, you're not deer hunting. You are surviving. Okay? So uh, this is something that you got, have to make sure that you know how to use. Obviously, a flashlight if you want to wander around in the dark. Um, I always thought if you knew where you were, you wouldn't need a flashlight to get back. Um, you know, in the dark, probably the best thing to do is find a comfortable place to start a fire and spend all night watching that fire burn. That is the best way to keep warm and to not go further away from the people who are looking for you. So when in doubt, at night, start a fire. When in doubt, at night, start a fire. If you carry extra batteries for your flashlight, you'll be further away from the truck when it gets light. <laughs> okay, and the very last thing, and we've all heard this. Okay. Make sure that at least one person knows where you are going. If you are going to wait for somebody to find you, it would be a really good idea if they knew where to start looking for you. So make sure somebody knows where you're going. One of the things on that list, and I don't remember if it's on that list, but one of the things on the list that we always made sure was there was the last thing that you did. There was a sheet that we left on the counter whenever my kids and I went deer hunting, um, telling my wife exactly where we were, exactly where we were. That way, to exactly where the camp was, this is with an X on a map, complete with a, with a map. This is where we camp. Knives. There's a whole variety of knives out there, and uh, they all pretty much, whoops, 
are going to serve the same purpose. You know, it's going to be something, it's a tool for you to use when you're, you might be processing your deer, you might be cutting a piece of salami off your lunch. Um, but there's a whole a variety of uses for a good quality knife. My recommendation is take more than one. My recommendation um, I take a whole handful of knives. I think I probably have probably no fewer than four in my pack. Uh, I don't I don't personally carry a bone saw with me, but I know people who do. And that bone saw is for making uh, is for processing game and it allows you to get it into smaller pieces if you're packing something out. It's not that big of a deal if you're white tailed deer hunting. Uh, it is a big deal if you're elk hunting. If you're going to take something that's way bigger than you can carry and, and process it into a smaller, more mobile piece, that bone saw is going to help. Locating and seeing deer. It's usually not quite like that. The first thing that if you're familiar with the sign of whatever it is that you're hunting in this particular slide, it's uh, it's deer. Um, sign comes in a whole variety of forms. The top you see some deer tracks in the uh, in the dirt. In the bottom you see some pellet groups. Uh, one of the things that's going to help you a lot is how fresh is the sign. You can be in an area where a deer hasn't been for a month and still find evidence that that deer was there. And through experience, you'll be able to figure out how long it was, not within, sometimes you can tell within a matter of hours how, if it's something was been there. But the goal is to tell is this, you know, varying degrees of freshness. Am I seeing a lot of repeated sign? Here's old sign. Here's some that's not so old. Here's some real fresh sign right here. If you go up to a tank or a drinker and you can see where the deer was drinking out of it and when it lifted its head and walked away, there's drops of water on the ground still to where that thing has just been there within a, an hour or so you being there. That's all sign. It, it is something other than the visual sight of the animal that gives you uh, knowledge of that animal being present or at least have been present in the past. You can see that upper track up there, if you're not you familiar with this, that, um, that the center ridge um, that caused by the two portions of that deer's hoof are very sharp, very well defined. That track is in dust, in dirt. You can so see that uh, the inside of that track is very clear. So, you know, that track could be 10 minutes old. That track could be an hour old. If it's blowing real hard, the track's probably not an hour old. If it's raining, it's probably not an hour old. You have to take into consideration environmental conditions. There's been a lot of times when you're hunting first thing in the morning on a frosty morning where you can see tracks of a deer walking through a frosty meadow or crossing the frosty road. You know that that's at least as fresh as that frost is. It's obviously uh, at noon when the sun's shining on it, it's not going to be there. So... Uh, you know, just there's all these environmental conditions that's going to give you a feel for how fresh that sign is. And that all comes from experience. You can, uh, you know, we've all hunted with people that are just starting. And, and you have to realize that a lot of times people when they're just starting, and I think every one of us was exactly the same way, you be patient with these people when you're with them, but whether or not they're kids or whether or not they're your next door neighbor that you're taking out deer hunting for the first time, because they haven't had the experience that you have, and they really, they recognize it's a deer, tay or a deer track, but they might think it's a week old when it was an hour. Most of the time people think it's far fresher than it actually is. Experience. Experience. Once again, this is how a lot of people view hunting. It does occasionally happen this way, does but not rarely, way, or, or not that often. I mean, it rarely rare. does it. Or, or not that um, this is not rare. what your average hunter is going to see on his first day out hunting. This photo is meant to show kind of a more typical hunting scenario. This particular deer, obviously, it's later in the morning or maybe it's late in the afternoon. This is photo or this deer is at a time when it's not active. And if it's not active, 
during the day, most of the time, a deer or an elk, whatever it is, is going to seek shade and is going to be bedded down somewhere in the shade. So if you were out looking, hunting during the day, you know, one of the places to really key in on are those good shady areas. Using binoculars. Getting back to that one slide where we showed equipment. Getting back to that one slide where we showed equipment. There are a lot of times when I go out that the number one most important piece of equipment I take with me is my binoculars. My binoculars are more important than my rifle is. I want my binoculars. Um, I might go if I happen to forget them, which you know I might. I might the next time I go out, but so far I never have. That if I do forget them. I am not going to be comfortable when I am out there just with my rifle. I can't stress binoculars enough. I can't stress binoculars are like all pieces of equipment in that you have to develop a lot of skill in using them. It's far there's far more to it than just lifting them up to your eyes to see what it is that you already are looking at with your naked eyes. A lot of people use their binoculars just to see what it is, um, and then you have people that that use their binoculars to find stuff. With. They use their binoculars to find stuff with. Technique in holding your binoculars is really going to improve your ability to use them in fine wildlife. The key is keeping your binoculars steady. And there are a variety of different positions that you can use to do that. You can see the guy up here on the upper right resting his elbows on his bedside. The guy down here in the bottom is sitting down resting his elbows on his knees. Um, probably the one that you see the most sitting down, or the most common one is the guy sitting down, resting with his elbows on his knees. Now getting back to the conditions that you're hunting in, if you're hunting somewhere where it's cold, if it's wet, if there's snow, that's going to become an uncomfortable position in pretty short order. And, and you see people that carry pads that they sit in, and those guys, their second most important piece of equipment other than their binoculars is their pad. And uh, I have found a few of those pads, and I've never walked by one of them. I've taken every one of them home because I like them. Um, it, sitting down in glass and comfort is a big thing. And if you're in the snow, you're not going to be glassing sitting down with your knees, uh, elbows on your knees, very long. You'll be there just long enough to get cold and wet and then maybe going back to camp. Maybe going back to camp. The other thing that is really going to amaze you, and this is something that I always stress, is using your binoculars, putting them on a tripod. If you've never used binoculars on a tripod, it will amaze you. And there's two things that, that you'll notice. The very first thing is, is you'll notice how many birds there are in the world. Because you don't see birds when you're looking through your binoculars, uh, when you're sitting down with your elbows on your knees. You don't see them at a mile. When you have them on your tripod, you're only limited by your eyes and the magnification of your binoculars. You see a lot of people anymore um, getting very, very high quality, high power binoculars. Binoculars that are so strong that they have to be used on a tripod all the time. You know, guys will get 15 power Swarovski binoculars. These are expensive binoculars. They cost over $2,000 a pair. And they'll sit there on binoculars. But that person with those binoculars, he can see and spot wildlife for miles from where he's at. Those people tend to move one spot during the day. They'll get up to the top of a hill. And I hunt that way sometime, but I don't have those binoculars yet. But uh, you'll get to one spot and they don't move. Um, they might have one or two vantage points all day long, and all they do is set their binoculars up on that hill and glass. And uh, their train of thought, and I agree with them, and a lot of, depending on what you're hunting, is there's no need to start moving until I've seen something. And that's the value of a, a good pair of binoculars. See the guy up here in the upper left? He's using a spotting scope. Uh, has all the same advantages of a good pair of binoculars. Spotting scopes oftentimes can be of a higher magnification than the binoculars. But once you get over about 20 power, doesn't matter what, uh, just the distortion from the heat waves and from the atmospheric conditions pretty much make those higher magnifications very, very hard to use for very long. Disadvantage to a spotting scope is it's just one eye. So you end up with one eye all the time, 
Um, it's much more comfortable with a pair of binoculars on a tripod where you can sit down, relax, have both eyes open, have good quality binoculars. And I recommend that you buy the best binoculars you can afford. And that is going to be the quality of glass that is in there, as well as the alignment and just how well it's constructed. The better pair of binoculars that you buy, the more comfortable they're going to fit you and the longer you're going to use them. If a pair of binoculars that you use hurts your eyes after five minutes, you're not going to use them very long. And you're, not, you're just not going to become an effective um, glasser until you have a really good pair of high-quality binoculars that you can sit down and look at. You know, you look at your watch and go, ah, it's lunchtime. You've been sitting there for half a day. And you sit there and eat lunch, and then you look and say, well, it's time for me to leave, or it's going to get dark before I get back. So good quality binoculars. I really, truly can't stress that enough. Techniques. Everyone uses uh, just one of a couple of techniques. And whatever one they use, it, the trick here is to be systematic. One of the values of putting these good quality binoculars on a tripod is most of these tripods, um, they tend to move easier horizontally and vertically. So you can set them up and you can kind of loosen up the adjustments to where they're sitting on your face. You don't even have to hold them with your hands and you can kind of just bump them from field of view to field of view. So you're not just scanning as you go, you're setting this up and it's you're not even touching it and you're looking through your binoculars like you're looking at a TV screen or you're looking out a window. You're right there just staring at it. Um, this, the more still that field of view is, the better that does me. Um, the better your chances of seeing something. And when you're glassing, like when you're looking for all wildlife, you're not looking for the whole deer standing there in the wide open hillside. You're looking for the flicker of an ear behind a bush that makes you um, catch that animal and you're picking up movement or you're picking up color. But you can see this slide goes over and shows the up and down technique in the upper right versus the side by side in the lower right. And you can sit there and systematically grid an entire hillside by setting up your tripod. You are going to look at every square inch of that hill, and you're going to take your time and look. You're going to see birds flying around on it, rock squirrels running around, bunnies and quail, and then all of a sudden you'll catch a little movement, and it'll be a deer bedded down. It'll be the flick of a deer's ear from a mile away. And uh, that's the value of putting these on a tripod. That's the value of putting these on a tripod. Looking for deer and other wildlife, and this is what we were just talking about. You'll be far more successful if you're looking for parts of a deer than you are if you're looking for a whole deer. If you're looking for an antler or um, a horizontal line of maybe the back of a deer, uh, anything white, kind of the rump of a mule deer, you're going to find, automatically see, all the deer that are in the wide open. They're just going to jump out at you. If you're looking at something that, if you're looking for a whole deer on the hillside, you're going to miss all these other ones unless something is moving. You'll always catch movement. When uh, we used to do uh, wildlife surveys years ago when I was in research, the biologist that I worked with, a uh, man named Jerry Day, he always stressed that we look for javelina. Um, if we were searching for javelina, we'd always see the deer. But if we were looking for deer, you'd miss the javelina. Javelina were little black dots that just didn't fit the search image of a deer. But if you're looking for javelina, you always saw the deer. So that was just a matter of search image. So that was just a matter of search image. So this upper photo right here, if you look at it, and if you're just looking for a deer in the open, you're not going to catch these little things that just don't fit into what you're seeing. That upper slide's a pretty busy picture right there. There's a lot going on, a lot of vertical, horizontal structure, a lot of different colors, but there what you're catching is that tail, and you can also catch its face over there. Um, certainly you would catch that deer moving easily. Down here in the lower right, down here in the lower right, I ran that out a little quick. 
I was going to see if we saw the two deer on the lower quick. right. I was going to see if we saw the two deer. That's one thing that we have to remember while we're hunting. That's one is thing that we where there's one, there's likely to be two. You know, where there's two, there's likely to be more. So just because you see one animal or two animals, you have to spend a little bit of time and sit there and uh, look at them for a while if they're undisturbed, just to see if you're looking at everything that's present. Talking about search image, here we have that mule deer that's really standing out as something different than all those aspens. Down here on this whitetail, the thing that stands out obviously is that Contrasting deer tail. Contrasting deer tail. Okay, here's a good photo. Now, first of all, these deer know you're there. At least one of them does. But looking at it, you might at first glance think you have one or two. That this photo is just stressing looking for additional deer. So. Before I press the next button, and I'm going to ask you guys, how many deer do we have in this photo? I'm going to ask you guys, how many deer do we have in this photo? Five? Seven? Five? Seven? Okay. Somewhere between five and seven, and five, six, and seven. Five and seven, and five, six, and seven. So... Obviously, that's almost not a fair question because Obviously, that's almost not a fair the person who took this photo stared at it for a long time and probably uh, ended up knowing how many deer were on it. Some of these you'd never guess are a deer by themselves until you saw the other deer in the open. Now you're looking, once you see a deer in the open, you're trying to make deer out of something that all you can see is a little bit of a thick spot when you're going through some of these mesquites. There are a total of nine right there. Total of nine right there. Here's another one. Here's another one. Now looking at it, I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maybe eight, maybe in the bushes here. Maybe eight, maybe in the bushes here. But this is once again, if you have plenty of time, you glass up bedded deer. You're not in a hurry. They don't know you're there. It's going to be worth your while. Just sitting there waiting for him to get up. That might mean two hours. That might be three hours. Might be 15 minutes, depending on when you see it. But there are not too many times that you're going to be able to make them get up that they're not going to leave in a hurry at some point. Um, at the point that you, as a hunter, start moving them, they react to your presence. They're probably not going to be in your presence very much longer. Now, it could be right here, if you're slipping along and you see a deer, I think the deer, just by the way you can see the ears on them, a lot of these deer know this person is there. If you're looking and you see that they know you're there, you're going to sit or stand right here and not move, because they're going to sit there and wonder, what are you? If they don't automatically know what you are, or maybe if they do think you're a person, but they're trying to figure out what it is that you're doing, let them get up by themselves. They're going to give you a lot more time than if you walked at them just to see if there was a buck in there. There was a lot more deer down here in this photo. Now, we couldn't see a whole lot of those from this upper photo. Six deer in the upper photo. Fourteen deer in the lower photo. When and where to locate deer. When and where to locate deer? When and where to locate deer like most wildlife are most active in the early morning or in the uh, late afternoon, early evening. That's when we're most likely to see them. They're active all night long. They might, they may bed down in the middle of the day or in the middle of the night for a period of time. Um, but they're active during the night. But they're active during the night. They typically bed down during the middle of the day. They typically bed down during. In this bottom sentence here is and that's for sure true i can't tell you how many times i've watched a bedded deer that i'll pick up i might be on one of my vantage points where i'm going to sit here all day long and at 10 o'clock i'll pick up a bedded deer that's out there and you can't help but watch it during the course of the day while you're looking for something else 
and it's very common to look over and see that deer will be up and it'll feed for 10 minutes and then it'll go back and lay down and then it'll be up so what that also means is the deer that you can't see that's currently bedded down is going to be up during the course of the day somewhere is going to be up during give you an opportunity to see it when it's not truly their activity period but they are going to be up um, for a short period of time and then bed back down for a short period of time and then bed back down now depending on the country that you're in uh, these two photographs you know, first thing in the morning, you're apt to catch a deer almost anywhere. You know, during the course of the, at night when it's dark, uh, they might feed out into the middle of something that's just wide open. And at first light, you might catch them in something that's wide open as they're making their way back in the early morning toward cover. They're uh, more apt to be out on the open slopes, on these open ridges. During late, later in the evening, or pardon me, later in the morning, they tend to uh, make their way toward cover and, and a deer's idea of cover is shade which tends to be in most places trees or brush of some form so keep use that to your advantage um, in the upper photo it would be easy to use that to your advantage in this upper one um, this upper photo right here I can't really see that back ridge right below the knob very well that photo in the upper right but Early in the morning, I might work that edge or work this open a lot. And I, I wouldn't ignore those trees up there. But come mid-morning in the afternoon, I'd spend a lot more time focusing on the trees. I'm not looking for deer that are out feeding in this wide open meadow. Uh, once they bed down, I'm looking for deer where they are going to be bed down, which is going to be in some of the thicker pockets, some of the more shade-covered slopes. So in a lot of areas of the state, so you have a big difference between the vegetation found on the north facing slope and the south facing slope. This is just the vegetation's response to cooler temperatures and more soil moisture. So if it's cooler and the temperatures are moister, you tend to have trees. A lot of that stuff south and east of Tucson is a great example. All those south facing slopes are wide open grass. And all those north facing slopes are or some form of oak, big oak trees, lots of trees and brush. And it's just simply a response to soil moisture and soil temperature. So in this desert situation here to the right, there's actually a lot of places for a deer to bed when you would first think that, huh, I'm not sure there's even a deer there. But if you're a desert mule deer, or even a whitetail, there's a lot of places right there to bed. You'll see embedded in some of these this brush right here in the lower portion of this um, lower slide, right in front, that little bit of shade that's provided by that those, they look like maybe little mesquites, um, is more than enough for them to get in. If you look further up, there's some, looks like juniper trees um, up there in the rocks. The rocks themselves will provide shade. These deer are getting out of the sun and just being more comfortable in the shade. This photo here has plenty of places to find deer. Okay, this photo, you look at it. And if I'm hunting, there's a lot of places that I hunt that I'm confident that when I hunt through an area, I transition from looking for deer that are up and feeding to looking for deer that are bedded. And if you're looking for deer that are bedded, that means you're looking under as many of these trees as you can see. And this photo right here with this juniper tree and these deer underneath it, that's a, that's a great photo. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen deer exactly, exactly like that. There'll be one single tree out there providing shade. And because there's not a whole lot of trees, there's a great contrast. It's well lit behind it. Those deer are backlit to where it looks like you have black deer sitting in a white background. And that's a very, very common scenario. If you're glassing, Make sure you pay attention to those places. Now, if you're there at first light, you've already watched those deer walk under that tree. But if you're going over the hill on your way back to camp or if you're hunting an area a little bit longer after the deer are starting to bed down, that's where you're looking for them. You still might have a deer up walking around in the middle of the day, but most of the time you're going to be looking for bedded deer underneath the tree. On that tree right there, there are five mule deer bucks under that tree. 
Okay, shot placement and field care. Okay, shot placement and field care. We've done our homework. We have all of our equipment, our rifle sighted in, our backpacks full of whatever it is that we need. First of all, our deer tag, but all the ta all the equipment that we have in there to process it. We've camped in the right spot. It's a beautiful day. We've gone out and we have found the deer that we are going to shoot at. Um, it, if you're up on the Kayabab and you're a junior up there, this may be a doe. If you're in any of the other units that have a deer hunt, it's a buck. So this is a time where it's time to put into action everything you practice. Try to keep a hold of your emotions, focus, concentrate, and make a good, clean shot. Responsible hunters are only going to take shots that they're confident they can hit. Let's look at this deer photo one more time. Let's look at this deer photo one more time. Now, what do you see on this deer photo right here? Is this a good now, shot or what not? What do you see on this deer photo right here? Is this a good shot or not? It's a shot you can certainly take. It's a shot you can certainly take. But you can see that little bit of brush right in the way. You can see that. And I'll tell you a story from a deer that my daughter shot on the Kaibab that hit, it hit a single branch. It hit a single out in front of the deer, I'm not sure how far, 30 to 40 yards in front of the deer, and the bullet hit into pieces and hit that deer with four or five different pieces of the bullet, all the way from one end to the other. And we tracked the deer down and we got the deer. But the deer didn't react at all like I expected it to react. So it did react like it was shot, but it didn't act like it was shot well. And I couldn't figure out why. And it was, the bullet was not whole when it hit the deer. That little bit of brush right there in front of that deer, there's a great chance that this bullet is not whole. It might be in a big piece, but it most likely is not whole when it goes through that brush on the other side. Doesn't take much or much brush when you have a, a bullet traveling at high velocities that's built to come apart. Doesn't take much. Trajectory. Now, based on your experience as a shooter, um, this may or may not come into play. Uh, juniors, young hunters, I don't recommend you take any shot that's, and it's going to be entirely dependent on how long you you've practiced long being how far you've practiced how comfortable you are at making shots at a at a fairly long range um, but getting back to what we are trying to do and that is we are only making shots that we are comfortable at taking bullet trajectory changes greatly over distance this bullet is impacted by two things wind resistance is causing a decrease a rapid decrease in the velocity of the bullet in gravity, you have to remember gravity. Number one rule in life, gravity always wins. So uh, that bullet is being pulled down to the ground by gravity. So what that means is you may have a rifle that's sighted in at 100 yards, but it's going to be somewhere far different at 300 yards than where it's hitting at 100 yards. So you have to know your firearm, you have to practice so with it, you have to know at what range you're comfortable shooting and how your bullet performs at those dis different distances. And when you're out at the range, all of our ranges have uh, targets at a varying degree. If, if you practice and you never practice further than 200 yards, and don't take a shot further than 200 yards. You have to know how your bullet is, how your rifle is going to perform. Vital areas. Vital areas. Now the the perfect bullet placement is right there behind that front shoulder in the heart and lung area. Trying to disrupt the the heart or the lungs. Now, they're pretty well protected behind a, a skeletal system, whether it's a shoulder blade, ribs, uh, muscles. You know, modern rifles or modern center fire rifles, a good um, larger caliber with a bullet designed for hunting is designed to give you the penetration and energy to where uh, you can 
confidently know that if you hit a deer right there, that that deer at some point in the near future is going to have your deer tag attached to it. A little bit of shots. And you know what? This, this made me think. I'm going to see if the slide is here. I kind of skipped a piece. I kind of skipped a piece. Um, I don't see that slide. But uh, one thing that I did with my kids, and it's something else that I always, I, I uh, firmly believe in this, is if, if uh, I don't believe in shooting a caliber or uh, uh, a cartridge lesser than what I think it should be just because it's a smaller person shooting the rifle. There are some very good quality muzzle brakes out there that will greatly reduce the recoil of any rifle out there to a point where your kids can comfortably shoot them. Um, I took my 270, which is a gun that I've shot all my life, and when my kids were old enough to hunt, I went out and I put a muzzle brake on it. And I'll tell you a little bit about what the muzzle brake is designed to do. What it does, as you know, a rifle is shooting a cartridge, shooting a bullet down a bore. It's a straight line, and that bullet leaves the bore, leaves the barrel. And when it does, all the gas that is pushing that bullet out at the point that bullet leaves the barrel now acts as exhaust and pushes that rifle back. Recoil is a result of all that gas pushing that rifle back once the bullet leaves the barrel. What a muzzle brake does is if you've seen it, it looks like a little silencer type device that screws on to the end of your rifle bore. You have to take it down and have it put on professionally by a gunsmith. But to my 270, it added about two inches, maybe two and a half inches to the bore. And I had that put on there. And what it is, is you look at it, and the muzzle brake is nothing more than an extension on your rifle bore that has a series of holes drilled at, to me it looks like it's a 90 degree angle, it probably isn't, but it's 90 degrees to the direction of travel of that barrel. And they're drilled opposite each other in essentially circles, rings, down that muzzle brake. So the theory behind it, and I've watched it work, so I do believe in it, is as that bullet passes each of those rings, circles of holes, gas is vented out. It's vented out perpendicular. It's not going out the end of the barrel. The gas is vented out um, 90 degrees to the travel of the barrel or the bullet. So as it passes these series, by the time the bullet leaves the barrel, most of the gas is gone, and it results in very little recoil. Now, some of these, I have heard, um, are louder than others. This is everything comes with its pluses and minuses, and the downside to a muzzle brake is volume is not all going out the front. The loud noise is not all going out the front. It's coming out the sides now. Now, the type that I have on my rifle, it to the shooter is very comfortable. If I am five yards to the side of my kids when that gun goes off, it is loud, and you have to just remember that, take that into account, put your fingers in your ears. If you have time, remember part of, of good planning is ear protection, um, but I can't tell you how well that muzzle brake made my kids shoot. had nothing to do with their ability, had everything to do with making them comfortable with the rifle. And uh, the first time I took my my uh, daughter out, she was 10, and we were shooting 150 grain loads out of my 270. Uh, they were just about as hot as you can make a 270, and it took me a while to make her shoot it the first time because she was afraid to shoot it the first time. I said, I don't care if you close your eyes and pull the trigger. I just want you to feel that gun go off, and she did. And at that point, she shot every bullet I had. She shot my 270 27 times that day just at metal plate. She had a ball. And it was all because she was comfortable shooting it. Um, you know, when I was her age, without a muzzle brake, I wasn't very comfortable shooting that 270 27 times. So getting back to shot placement, it makes a huge difference if you're shooting this deer with a 270 versus shooting this deer with something. Um, you know, a 243 is a good caliber rifle, but a 243 is far less than what a 270 is. So in terms of a 270, a 30-odd six, 
Some of these very um, well-designed bullets that have a lot of energy associated with them, very good hunting cartridges with a little bit of work on your rifle by a local gunsmith, you can have something that you, your kids will love to shoot. So that was my little soapbox on muzzle brakes. Well worth the investment. Well worth knowing that your kids are shooting something that has plenty of energy that is more than capable of um, making a good, clean shot on a deer or an elk. Okay, we're going to go through. We've made our shot. Okay. Here is uh, a deer in this particular position. Question. Is this a good shot? Question. Is this a good shot? And we can all see why it's not. You know, the vitals on this deer, you can imagine where they are, but you can't see them. What you see is about two and a half feet of muscle and bone and other organs before you get past the diaphragm into the lungs and heart. Here's another one. Boy, the vitals are just jumping up and looking at you on that lower right hand photo. But once again, is this a good shot? And we can see that even though the deer is, you know, if you had a little bit of time and weren't, you would still like that deer totally broadside or maybe quartering, but that shot, you know, once again with a good quality caliber rifle, that shot, in terms of the buck, is a good shot. But in terms of the doe behind him, it's not a good shot. You have a great chance of that bull and passing through and you shooting more than one deer on that lower right hand photo on that lower right hand photo okay the animal's down a couple of things that we have to do couple of things we have to do first step is just to make sure the animal is dead is just to make sure the animal is dead second is to tag the deer immediately second is to you'll see that uh, you'll see that the tag gives you instructions on how you are to tag whatever game it is that you're hunting. It's on the back of it. Shows you where to tag it on a leg if it's a doe um, or if it's a cow elk. Instructions on if it's a turkey. Instructions on if it's an antlered deer. Turkey, antlered elk. But the first thing you do is put the tag on it. But the first thing you do is put the tag on it. Here, this gentleman is putting the tag on this antler deer. Here, this gentleman is putting the tag on this antler. Comes with an adhesive back. You pull that back off. Comes with an adhesive. And you back. affix the tag back, back to back so it first can be red, and second, it cannot be taken off again. I've seen these applied to where they'll start. Essentially, they'll start on one end, and they'll put one end on the antler, and they'll wrap it all the way around. And when it's all done, the entire tag is wrapped on. It, to where you can't read anything on it, but the whole tag's on the deer. You just can't read anything that's on the tag. So, the lower right-hand photo is the proper way to seal that tag so everything can be read. Okay, now that we have a deer, or whatever it is, but in this photo we're going to talk about a deer. The next step is field dressing it. Now. If you've been fortunate enough to either go with your parents, your dad and uncle, and watch him field dress one, or maybe field dress your first one, then you know what it is, at least in theory, that you're to do. If your first attempt at, at field dressing a deer is from uh, looking at a series of slides, then it might take you a little longer. But the first thing you do is you put it upside down. The entire... Um, all the organs of this deer are protected either by the back bone on the top, the chest cavity where the heart and lungs are, the pelvic girdle on the rear end. So you have to go in right there upside down on its belly. So you particularly, in this slide, you turn it upside down. This guy has taken a couple of pieces of rope, which um, if circumstances are such that you have to tie that those deer's legs out so that you can properly field dress it, then that's one way. If you have somebody helping you, then you have somebody holding the legs while you, well, we'll address a couple of myths first. Bleeding the animal. 
You don't have to cut its throat. Bleeding Make sure animal. all the blood is out of the animal before you, don't have to cut its you start field dressing it. You don't have to cut off the tarsal glands, which are the glands right there on the uh, on the lower legs. But when you're starting to field dress it, you can cut the genitals free from the body. You can cut the genitals free from the body. Once you get them off to the side, it exposes. You've taken the hide off of the abdomen, and now you can see uh, the abdomen allow you to get into the body cavity. Now, proof of sex, proof of gender, you have to be able to show, if this is an antlerless deer hunt, that what you have is an antlerless deer. So proof of sex is something that has to be there. You can do it one of two ways. You can leave the genitals attached to the body, or you can leave the head attached to the carcass. You can tell the sex of any animal that way. Sex of any animal that way. This individual is starting by severing, cutting around the anus. And right there, you're in the pelvic girdle right there, so you have to cut it all the way around to where you're loosening it and freeing it from the pelvic girdle. Then once you've done that, you can go up and open up the abdominal cavity and then pull that right out through the abdominal cavity. Right so you're loosening it from the pelvic girdle, and you're pulling that along with the part of the intestine up through the pelvic girdle. Now here's the part where you, you really have to be a little bit careful so that you can keep everything nice and clean. As you are cutting this, and this individual, this gentleman is doing it perfect, and this is the way I would recommend it. You take your two fingers and put it inside to where it's right underneath the membrane that is the abdominal cavity or the abdomen. And you put your knife blade right in there. So what you're doing with your fingers is you're, with your fingers, you're pushing the belly, you're pushing the stomach down away from your knife blade. And then that way the knife blade itself is opening up, cutting the muscle of the abdomen. Is opening up, cutting the muscle of the abdomen. And at this point, if you've made a good clean shot and there's and nothing is disrupted behind the diaphragm, meaning the stomach and the intestines and everything are intact, no bullet has gone through there, your goal is to keep it nice and clean right here. The best way to do it is to not cut something that you're not intending to cut. Once you have this animal opened up, from stem to stern all the way up. You don't have to, as in this diagram, you don't have to go all the way up to the neck. You have to go up. I go up right to the sternum, which is that rib cage right there. Um, you, you can essentially, from this point, completely uh, complete finishing field dressing the animal. So right here, you see everything in front of the diaphragm. Right here, you the diaphragm on the other side of it. The diaphragm is a really the tough muscle. That you're not going to be able to pull out of there with your hands. If it's still intact and it's not ripped, you're going to have to cut it with a knife. And on the other side of it is the heart and lungs. So you have stomach, intestines, liver. On this side of it, that big organ that we see right here with that lacy fat on it, that is the stomach. Uh, we don't want to open that up if you can keep from doing it. We don't want to open that up. But the goal is, is at this point, you can take everything out of there. Here in this lower right-hand photo, you see where the guys cut the diaphragm. Everything is ready to go at this point. Here he is pulling everything out. He's completely severed the diaphragm. A lot of times this might be a two-stage process. If you want to at this point, you can actually, before you get into the diaphragm, you can pretty much, if it's a deer, a whitetail, something you can move. If you want to, you can get away from the lower end, uh, the stomach, the liver, everything. Cut it right there at the diaphragm, roll it out, move it a little bit, uh, the, the deer, and then finish field dressing it. Get up there and underneath the diaphragm, pull out the heart and lungs. So the goal here is to get it to where you have this chest cavity wide open and empty, like you see right here in this lower right. Here the guy is gently, slowly pulling that bladder out. You don't want to sever the bladder and get urine and everything in there. Uh, when you're field dressing it, this thing is going to be full of blood. And the advantage to having it full of blood is uh, the things that you have in there that you don't want in the meat are going to wash out when you're tipping it up. That's what this guy is right here. 
if there's uh, some deer pellets floating around in there, if there's if the bladder is, most of it's coming out right here. You're still going to have to wash it. It's still going to be processed. But in terms of cleaning this carpet, up, this carcass up, when you tip it upside down, the blood that's in the chest cavity is going to come right out, and it is going to do a pretty good job of washing out everything in the lower portion of the carcass. Once it has been field dressed. The goal is, and this is field dressed right here, but it's still not skinned, and, our, and we have to get the hide off of this so that we can get this carcass cooled out. Now, we don't have many times in Arizona where we're going to have a whole deer like this guy in the back. Most of the time, if you're out camped out, your deer is going to end up just exactly like this guy. It's going to be skinned. It's going to have a game bag over it or some, something over it to keep the bugs off of it if it's an October hunt. Um, and you're going to let it cool out, dry out overnight, um, cool out overnight, and it's going to be fine. And it's going to be fine. Quality of a hunt. What makes a quality hunt? Doesn't mean you have to shoot the biggest deer out there. It is uh, a quality hunt is just a time out in the woods. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be successful. Doesn't necessarily time spent out in the woods with the people that you're there um, or by yourself when you're just out enjoying the fact that you're out in the woods. You know, keep in mind that a quality hunt is what you make it. If you have a lot of pressure trying to, um, if your goal is to be successful and shoot a huge deer every time you're out there, you might not be uh, um, as happy at the end of the hunt as you would if your goal would just be to get away from work, spend a fun, relaxing weekend with my kids out in the field. So, uh, okay. So I'm going to speed this up a little bit so we have enough time to answer a few questions here at the end. This is a trophy animal. Um, once again, doesn't have to be a large buck. This obviously is a kayabab hunt. Any animal taken in a sporting way is a trophy animal. Any animal taken in a sporting way is a trophy animal. Yeah, that that was my daughter's first year. Yeah, that that was my daughter's first year. Photos. A lot of times it takes a lot of money to take something to the taxidermist, but in today's age of digital cameras, you can take really good digital photos. It's not going to cost you an arm and a leg to get all your photos developed like it did 10 years ago. Um, when in doubt, take a photo. You know, make sure you take a little bit of time and dress your photos up just a little bit. You'll see a lot of photos that you look at it and you think, man, that is a really good photo. But you realize that really good photos, particularly of successful hunters, that person, chances are, that person has taken some time to make that a really good photo. You, you don't realize, if you look at a lot of your photos or look at a lot of your buddy's photos, you don't realize what you have in your photo that he doesn't have in his. Um, aside from the camera strap or a thumb, you know, or, or exposure issues, but, you know, the setting on this lower one could have been in a better spot. And this, this lower one right here, this last point, if you're taking a photo that at some point you're going to show to one of your friends who doesn't hunt, clean it up a little bit. Um, make sure the tongue's not hanging off to one side because it doesn't matter what you're trying to show that individual. If the tongue's hanging on to one side, all they're going to see is that tongue. And so put the tongue back in its mouth. It's covered with blood on one side. Flip it over. Take a photo of the other side. There's a lot of things that you can do to make a good quality photo that you need to think about doing it because when it when you're looking at that photo years down the way, you'll go, wow, I wish I would have tucked this tongue in his mouth or I wish I wouldn't have had that the way I had it. So take a second and think of it in terms of how one of your friends who might not hunt as much as you do, how's he going to think of this photo? So take a second and compose a good photo. Compose a picture. And compose a good photo. Compose a picture. You can see these are kind of some of the old typical photos. You can see these are kind of some of the old typical photos. This guy's taken some time and composed it. This guy really has. This guy's taken some time and composed it. It's kind of a cool photo. Take them from different distances. Take a lot of them. Get close to them. Get close to them. 
Here we have a couple of things to talk about specifically on the Kayabab. If you're going up to the Kayabab this year, successful deer hunters on the Kayabab are required to check out. The checkout station is right there by Jacob Lake. There will be a sign on just about any road you drive by that tells you where the check station is. This was what the check station looked like before a great big tree fell on it. Um, it's still in the same spot. It doesn't quite look the same way. It no longer has this great big old covered awning that runs off to the right that's gone. But the building is still the same. But this is where you'll come and we'll, we'll check out your deer. So we take some biological measurements, the weight, the age. Uh, we test it for CWD or take a sample from it and just document hunt success. So the other thing about the North Kaibab and the Strip, even 9 and 10, are condors and lead bullets. If you have a Kaibab tag, you've received a coupon or a voucher that allows you to get some uh, lead-free, non-toxic ammunition. And the purpose here is just so that we as hunters are not negatively impacting condors. It's a voluntary program. It's not something people are required to do, but in, in Arizona, we are wildly successful with this program. So if you have the voucher, I strongly recommend that you go get lead ammo, or non-lead ammo, pardon me, just for these. So that is that. I have a question from an email from an individual. Um, I'm going to read it out loud. It says, I drew a Kofi mule deer tag a couple of years ago and discovered that most people hunt the open, dry, desolate flats in King Valley by walking the washes in pairs. This was the first time I had seen this method used. It appeared that no available, no water was available for miles. How often do these mule deer water, and how many miles will they travel to reach it? Let's talk a little bit about the hunting technique these people were using. Um, down there, this is this is a, a pretty appropriate method to use to hunt down there. Now, depending on where you're at down there, a lot of this stuff is flat. There's no vantage point to sit there and glass from, so you have a couple of options. One of them is find a place and sit down and let a deer walk by you, or maybe if you have enough elevation to where you can glass and see something at a relatively close distance. The other, which is what it appears these folks were doing, is just slowly still hunting. If they were hunting these washes in pairs, that tells me that one person was on one side of the tree wash, one person was on another. Some of these washes in the southwest corner of the state, they can be almost jungles. I mean, we're down there in the southwest corner where there's not a lot of water, and it is truly the Arizona desert. But some of these washes are very complex, uh, vegetative communities, big ironwoods, big mesquites, um, and something that you would not be able to see a deer on one side or the other if, it, if you were walking through. So what these people were doing was going slow, hoping that they would see the deer, but at the same time, if they spooked it, chances are it would go to their buddy. In terms of the water, you know, there are only a few requirements in life, and water is definitely one of them. I spent a little bit of time working for U of A after I got out of high, or high school, out of college, and found that these radio deer, we had some deer that we were down by Yuma in the Welton Mohawk Canal, putting radio collars on them. And the radio collars, these deer were going as far as 8 and 10 to 12 miles out into the desert, and that is where they would bed, and they would trail back into the canal every night to get a drink of water. So these deer are going 20 miles round trip to get a drink of water. So it's going to depend entirely on water stress and how far they have to go. So with that, if we have any other questions or um, we're talking questions. Aha, uh -huh. yes, sir. Um, one of the things that has changed recently in our management is on the Kayabab, it used to be historically that when you purchased your deer tag, when you put in for the draw and purchased your deer tag or were drawn, you had to put in more money than the rest of the people who were deer hunting. That increase in money went toward getting your North Kayabab habitat stamp. I think that's the official name for it. And we no longer require you to put in your extra money when you put in for the application or put in for the deer tag. But that tag is now or that stamp is now a loose stamp that is sold like all the rest of our stamps, whether it be a two-pole stamp or a hip stamp, a trout stamp, and that is a Kayabab stamp. 
And those people who have deer tags on the Kayabab are required to have a Kayabab deer stamp. So you can swing by one of our vendors and buy that Kayabab deer stamp. The money from that stamp goes directly toward deer management on the North Kayabab. So that is the purpose. No, you're not required to, and, and I'm not sh exactly sure why. But it, the can't, the, the, uh, as you're probably aware, um, the North Kayabab was where uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt deer hunted. He set the North Kayabab up as a deer uh, preserve, not to preserve deer, but to hunt deer there. So that tradition has gone on, and that stamp is reflective of being able to put some money into deer habitat there on the North Kaibab. Any other questions? Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. You know, there's a whole variety of different non-lead um, rifle bullets. Some of them are copper. Some of them are of compositions that I just don't know. But if you go to some of the uh, bigger stores, whether it be Sportsman's Warehouse. In fact, I think Sportsman's Warehouse, unless I'm wrong, Sportsman's Warehouse is the uh, company that's working uh, with the department on, on the non-lead ammunition. But the, it's already pre, it's not something you have to hand load. It'll be commercially manufactured standard box of bullets that has non-toxic bullets in it. Yes. Um, the question was, if if you spot a deer a long ways away, what is the best way to get closer? Um, there's going to be a couple of things that come into play. One of them is going to be uh, exactly where is it? Can you can you get to that deer in enough time to be able to you know keep track of it and find it? If that deer is up and moving, I'm and if it's getting later in the morning, I personally would sit where I'm at. And just watch that deer and wait for him to bed up and then know that that is where he's bedded, particularly if he's far enough away that I'm going to lose sight of him for a significant amount of time. If you can't keep track of a deer that's moving and it's getting later in the morning, you're probably better off just letting it bed up and then get over on it. Um, if you happen to be hunting with somebody and you can either through hand signals or however you can communicate, one guy can watch the deer while somebody else goes after the deer and they can relay to you where the deer is and you can find it once you're there, then that may be uh, an alternative. Any other questions? Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Uh-huh. You know, there's, you can get Forest Service maps or BLM maps, you can get them online. Um, if you just Google them and try to figure out uh, if you know what forest you're on, you can go to Wide World of Maps, and they have a great selection of maps. Our department here out front has maps, all the Forest Service maps. Uh, but I really recommend that you get one for sure. But I really recommend that you get one for sure. Absolutely, and uh, and we would mail them out. Absolutely, and and uh, we would mail them out. Absolutely, and that comment was we you you can actually call into our game and fish office, and we would be able to sell you a map over the phone and then mail it out. A map over the phone and then mail it out. Uh huh. Okay. Absolutely, and I was just handed a note of just, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do uh, in addition to attending seminars or reading books, and there's a lot of great organizations out there. Um, you have uh, the Arizona Deer Association. This is a, a group of uh, people that uh, that organization is dedicated to deer and deer management in Arizona. You have different sportsmen's groups out there who might not be species-specific, but they're very much involved in all the species, uh, the Chandler Rod and Gun Club. Um, if you're down there in the southwest corner of the state, the Yuma Rod and Gun Club. Um, I was at the uh, um, Tonos Basin Sportsman's Club uh, last week. There's lots of good organizations, and you know, if you're new into um, hunting 
or or if you just want to participate and get involved in a group, there's plenty of great groups out there. Um, no shortage of uh, choices to get involved with. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes. Yes. In early November, where would whitetail be found? Um, you know, whitetail actually inhabit um, elevationally a pretty a pretty large uh, um, chunk. You know, you can get a, you can get whitetail deer here in 22, 23 in the Swara cactus down in the lower desert, all the way to the top of any mountain you can see there in the Matazels or anything else. A lot of it that time of year, uh, they really haven't started uh, moving around a lot. The only time where you might not find a deer where you had been scouting and found them is when in December when they start running. You'll see people who do a lot of scouting. They would prefer to have a, an October or a November deer tag versus a December deer tag. Because what happens when the rut starts and they start covering big chunks of ground looking for does, they're no longer where they, you may have found them during their scouting. So uh, I, I, I'm not, so, uh, with that question, if you found a deer in October, he's going to be pretty close there in November. He'll be hanging out there in that general area somewhere, unless he's spooked and run a long ways, or unless uh, once the rut kicks in, they may be, you know, a mile or so away, for sure. Um, I have a question here about, uh, can I talk a little about rifle recommendations, calibers, and scopes? Um, you know, getting back to the muzzle brake philosophy, um, taking a muzzle brake, if you're concerned about, what that does is eliminates recoil in my mind, and now you're just uh, talking about the benefit of one caliber versus another. For a deer-sized animal, something in the 25 odd 6, 270, 30 odd 6 uh, caliber is just a great choice. You know, a 30 odd 6, particularly if you hand load, if you do any reloading, there's such a huge variety of bullet designs and weights available to you in a 30 caliber bullet. Um, that 30 odd 6 is a pretty tough caliber to beat in terms of just what you can as a hand loader. You can go down, you can go up. But if you didn't, uh, hand load, any three of those would be a great caliber for deer. Any three of those would be a great caliber for deer. Um, I have a question. Is it required to hold a Forest Service recreational permit to hunt on the Tano National Forest? Now, that's going to be dependent on where you are hunting and where you're in a park. Um, not knowing exactly, there's a lot of forests anymore that are, are requiring uh, recreation permits. If you've gone to Bar Lake lately, you know you have to get a recreation permit to go park down there by the lake. If you're going to be up away from the lake, I know I pulled into Tano National Forest. This was two years ago that I did this. So I would recommend that regardless of what, re contact your local uh, National Forest office and ask them. Um, depend if you're going to be location specific, ask them if you're required to have this recreational permit. At one point in the Bartlett Lake area, I was told when I went in to see if I needed to buy an annual permit that I only needed it if I was parking down by the lake and I was uh, not using their facilities. But if you're familiar with that, there's a big sign and a kiosk as soon as you park and go, as soon as you turn toward Horseshoe Lake, it says you're required to have that permit and you're still a long ways from the lake. So uh, the question Really, you have to ask the forest, uh, whatever range or district you're at, if you need a rec permit. Another question. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, and the question was if if you locate a deer during the middle of the day that is bedded, what would be the best method or way to take it? And a lot of it's going to depend entirely on how much, you know, me, my ideal scenario, I sneak up to where that deer is, I build a rest, and I am at the spot that I want to shoot from when that deer stands up. That deer is going to stand up at some point. And, uh, you know, 
keep in mind that one of the the rules is you always have more time than than you need to. Don't rush it. You know, don't get impatient. If you don't have to take a shot at a bedded animal, don't. Um, you know, just by the way it's positioned on the ground, the vitals are definitely smaller than if it's standing up. So I would wait until I would get close, get ready, get prepared, and then wait until it stands up. Another question. Can you describe how to quarter out a deer in order to pack it out? A lot of this depends on whether I'm hunting a mule deer or a whitetail. If I'm hunting with somebody and it's a whitetail deer, um, I, I hunt a lot with my brother or, or my son. Um, we literally just cut that deer in half after it's field dressed, it's not skinned. We cut it in half, um, throw it over our backs and pack it out. Now keep in mind all the hunter safety rules and the things that you can do to make that look a whole lot less like the half of a deer that it is on your back. So uh, whether you put flagging on it, whether or not you cover it up with a coat, um, do something to where you're not carrying the head of a deer on the top of your back while you're walking through the brush. If you have time and skin it out, you are going to skin that deer out eventually. So if you have time, skin it out in the field right there. If you have a pack frame, um, you can skin it out, pack it out uh, that is already quartered. Mule deer are a little bit bigger. And if I'm going to if I'm going to quarter and pack something out, particularly an elk, I mean, an elk is a good example just because elk are big. Um, I quarter them out. And by quartering them out, I take the hind legs, the rear legs, out of the pelvic girdle to where and it's, it's uh, a great big ball and socket joint right there in the pelvic girdle. And I take that the head of the femur out of the pelvis, and you can get a whole quarter of, a, of an elk. And that quarter on an elk is going to weigh... You know, probably is going to weigh 75 to 90 pounds, depending on what it is. And I throw that on that pack frame. Now, believe it or not, it's usually a lot easier at this point if I take a front shoulder and I carry it in my arms. You know, because now I don't have all the weight on my back. I can actually carry something in my arms, and it kind of counterbalances the whole thing. But those front shoulders, and particularly the front quarters, they come off easy. There's no bone joint attachment on a front shoulder. It's held together with ligaments and muscle. So you can literally kind of pull that quarter out away from the rib cage and take your knife and follow along the side of the ribs and just separate that front quarter. And you'll be able to see where you need to cut as you separate the quarter. Um, if you have big mule deer, that is what I would do. And you can sit there and quarter it. A lot of times I'll skin it out there. I skin it, and as I skin it, I take the quarter off, and I'll put it on a log or I'll put it on a bush. And my goal is to cool it out. I usually have some mule tape or rope in my pack. Tie it up and hang it in the shade. And my goal is to get the body heat out of that game meat as fast as I can and cool it off. Um, so I think uh, that is what I would do. You know, with that being said, you still have four quarters, but now you have the rib cage, you have the neck, you have the back straps. There's a lot of meat left on that. Uh, a lot of us, um, I don't have it all the time, most of the time I do, you can get these big, heavy canvas or big, heavy cheesecloth game bags. I'll have one in my pack. And the purpose of that uh, is for the back straps, for the neck roast, for the meat that I'm going to trim off of that to where I'm not packing out bone. You know, I don't eat bone, and when I, when I trim it out, when I cut it myself, which I usually cut everything myself, nothing I cut has a bone in it. And uh, most of those bones are left wherever I was processing the animal out in the woods. So uh, you know, if you're out and about and you have a whitetail, that little, that little day pack that we saw a picture of on the slideshow, that little day pack is about big enough for an entirely boned out whitetail deer. You just, if you have time, sit there and skin it, bone it out, process it, put it all in the bag. Yes. Uh-huh. No, it is not. And the question had to do with the photos of our it of our not. slide show that most of the hunters were wearing camo. And uh, specifically, they were not wearing any type of orange or bright colors. Arizona does not have a hunter orange law. 
A lot of states do, in which you're required to have something around 300 square inches of honey orange, which is a hat and a vest or, or some type. We don't in Arizona. Um, that doesn't mean that it isn't a benefit and that you cannot wear it. You can certainly wear it. So uh, if you're in an area that you're concerned, by all means, you can wear hunter orange, particularly on a deer hunt. Um, and uh, if you're in an area where you're concerned that people see you, then by all means wear uh, bright colored clothes, hunter orange. Um, there's some red camouflage patterns if you still are concerned about deer seeing you, that you'll still not be able to be visible, that visible to a deer, but still plenty visible to hunters. But to answer your question, we do not have a hunter orange uh, law in Arizona. Very low. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other yes. questions? Yeah, and th that is a good question. Um, it's something that right now, and the question was, is game retrieval allowed in the North Kaibab with quads? Um, that's a question right now that I, I think you can, but I don't know for sure if you can. Um, we're currently in a state of flux as we're dealing with what you can and can't do with a vehicle. Um, it's slowly changing over time. It used to be 15 years ago that you could drive cross country to get to your game to retrieve down game. And now you'll, uh, um, we're working with land management agencies. Some are uh, uh, less reluctant to allow that to continue. And so it's it's very specific on where you're at. So I don't know if you can on the North Kaibab. There's some areas that uh, I don't believe you can at all. Um, but that's what pack frames are made. But that's what pack frames are made. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, I thank you for uh, attending and enjoy your fall. It is almost here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now that we're off here, I did bring a Kaibab map.